Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Extended Hands of God Highway Ministries. It's Monday night. We've got Pastor Steve Manville from Bethel Pentecostal there in uh, Patterson, Louisiana. Comes up every other Monday night, and he's going to share with us tonight. We we'll always look forward to having him, and uh, we're going to play a song uh, before he gets started. I'll just I'll let you introduce this song, Pastor Steve, and uh, I'll get it started. And then when the song's over, you can just uh, take it from there. Very good. Uh, This is uh, my son Dustin, and this is a song that he wrote and produced. It's called Crazy Awesome, and it talks about how crazy and how awesome it is that God would choose us to be part of his family. So without any more said, uh, the song is Crazy Awesome by Dustin. Amen. short along the way you know it's awesome he still loves me today i look behind and i see a mess yesterday's full of love regret but he has never failed me yet it's crazy to know that god is in control and that he leads and guides me and walks beside me it's an awesome thing to feel his presence so real And that it's all around me In love surrounding And that he keeps and guards and helps And holds back in right now and down the road It's crazy awesome You know it's crazy There's more that I don't know than I do You know it's Awesome, he's still faithful and true. I look ahead and it's so clear. Yet I'm always full of fear, but he's always proved himself so near. It's a crazy thing to know that God is in control and that he leads and guides me and walks beside me. It's an awesome thing to feel. His grace is so real and that it's all the And he keeps in guards and helps and holds back in right now. Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to tonight's broadcast. We sure welcome you. Pray that you hope and pray and feel that you felt the presence of God through the song, through the worship, and now it's time to go into the Word of God. I want to talk to you tonight about a subject that gets very little attention in our world. Oh, sure, people talk about it, but when I say get a little attention, most people don't know how to solve it. It's something that very few people feel comfortable addressing. It's something that is purposely overlooked and shied away from. It's something that people would rather leave to the professionals to take care of than handle it themselves. What is it that I'm referring to? I'm talking about loneliness. Loneliness grips 
every age group and classification of our society, from children to teenagers to adults to senior citizens, experts say that over 40% of all the people that are alive today will suffer from loneliness at at least one point in their life. Now, there's some very good reasons for this. I'd like to give you a few. Some people experience the pain of loneliness because of no fault of their own. The life that they have lived has become difficult. The life of a loved one or a child has been taken all too soon in life, and they've experienced the pain of having to live without that person for far too many years. That could be a lonely place. The hurtful actions of others have left them empty and scared. They don't know which direction to turn, and they're really fearful for the future. But mostly, they're lonely it's by no fault of their own. Life has dealt them an ugly blow, and they have no one on earth that they can turn to. Some people experience the pain of loneliness, the isolation of loneliness, because of nothing that they've done on their own. It's just the everyday circumstances of life. Then there are those people who simply like to be alone. They don't like to be in the crowd. They don't like to be in the limelight. They willingly choose not to interact with other people. The least amount of talking and interaction that they can do, the better off they are. They are more comfortable being by themselves than with anyone else. These people suffer from loneliness simply because they seem to enjoy it. Then there are those who are lonely because of the negative choices they have made in life. I said there are some people in this world that experience loneliness because of the negative choices they have made in life. These are the folks that have, quote, burned all the bridges behind them, so to speak. They are literally reaping what they have sown. Nobody wants to be around them because they weren't the kind of people that were friendly, kind, caring, or compassionate. And then lastly, there are those who are unfriendly and unkind to all the people that they meet. It doesn't matter where they are, what they're doing, who they're with. They're not friendly. They're not kind. But that reminds me of a scripture that comes from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, that says this. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Now that scripture goes on to say more, and I'll get to that in just a few moments. But I want to address that point at the beginning of tonight's message. Proverbs 18 and 24 specifically and clearly state that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. You want people to love you tonight? Then you've got to be a lovable person. You want people to be kind to you? Then you've got to be kind to them. You want people to be concerned about your life? Then take a genuine interest and concern in the lives of God, of those who God places in your life. And then, of course, there are those people whose lives have become immersed in their careers. Work has become like a God to them. Work is so important. They get up at the crack of dawn, sometimes before the sun rises, and they go to bed well after the sun sets. They are burning the candle at both ends and have no time for the more important things in life. These folks are experiencing the pains of loneliness simply because they have left no time for any other kind of interaction in their life. Yet, even with all that is said, we cannot ignore the fact that you and I are living in a world that promotes the concept of loneliness. Yes, that's right. We are living in a world that promotes the concept of loneliness. The electronic media today has replaced true and genuine face-to-face -face fellowship and conversation. I mean, I can look at it just in my short life, and I can see the time when I used to have to pick up the phone that was connected to the wall. Now my phone stays in my pocket and travels with me everywhere I go. Electronic media has left me in a place where I am constantly at the beck and call of anyone who calls me. But yet, 
it's also caused me to lose some valuable face-to-face fellowship and conversation with people. I challenge you, next time that you go into a public restaurant, next time that you go in to sit down and eat a meal and you're on the road, I want you to look at family members and people who come into a restaurant. They sit down at a, at a table. They order their food, sometimes even before they order their food. And the first thing that they do is they reach in their pocket or their purses, pull out their cell phones, and begin to communicate or search the web or communicate via text message, Facebook, and any other kind of social media that's out there. And they're not even talking to the one who's sitting with them at the table. This is not by accident. This is a deliberate attempt to isolate people in our society. Cell phones and other media devices are isolating people and families at an alarming rate. And, folks, I'm not against cell phones. I'm not against social media. I'm just telling you that these things that have caused us are are supposed to make us more interactive. They caused us to become more unfriendly and unknowing and unkind to other people. Why is that so? I don't know, but I can tell you this. In my off hours, I drive a school bus, and I have noticed something on my routes as I drive for an elementary school and a junior high school and a high school. I've noticed that there's a pattern that has developed, and it's as noticeable as the sun in the summer sky. When I pick up children on an elementary school route, I'll drive that bus down the street, and when I put those red flashing lights on and open up those doors, for the most part, those young people are excited about getting on that bus. They'll get off with a smile on their face. They'll talk to you. They'll greet you. They'll speak to you. They'll ask you questions. They'll show you what they have. They'll bring you to school. They'll show you their school projects. And that's almost always without question. 90% of those kids getting on that bus will greet you in the morning, will greet you in the afternoon, will show you the work that they did in school that day, will show you their school project that they did that day. They're still friendly. They'll shake your hand. They'll hug your neck, the elementary school kids. But there's a transition that takes place from elementary school to junior high school. When you get to the junior high school grades, the young teenage years, The young teenage years where all of a sudden young people pick up cell phones and begin to experience or or dabble in social media, the electronic world that we live in, the Internet. These young people will get on the bus, and it's hard to find someone smiling. Oh, they sure, every once in a while, they, they, they sure will. They'll smile. They'll communicate. You'll get a high every once in a while. But a lot of times these young people will get on the bus, they'll have their headphones in their ear, or they'll get on the bus, they won't even look at you as a driver. Even if you say hello, they won't respond to you. And they'll go and they'll find their place, and they'll sit down in their seat, and they'll remain there. And sometimes I remember just looking up in the, in the mirror on that big front wall of that bus, and I look at those young people, and I see them staring out the windows. It makes me wonder what they're thinking of. What is... What has life dealt them? How have they gotten to that place in their life when they're not really interested in looking at you or talking to you or greeting you or showing you some kind of kindness, even if it's just a smile or a handshake? But that's not the worst part because when you leave the elementary and the junior high school level, you go to the high schools. And the high schools today are as different from the elementary schools as day is from night. Most of the people, most of the young people that are getting on the high school school bus will never look at you. Very seldom will they talk to you. Almost never will you see a smile or ever have a question about what your life is like. They'll also have their headphones in. They'll also look out the windows. But they won't even communicate with each other. There's no laughter on these school buses. There's no joy that's filled their lives. There's no peace, it seems like, in their hearts. Why is this so? What kind of society are we producing? Let us not forget that we live in a world where we need to communicate. 
Communication is a key to a successful life. Communication with God first and then communication with others. But we are living in a world where there is a real devil out there who is doing all that he can to separate you from the love of Jesus and the ones that he has placed in your life. Your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, your family, your friends, your pastor, your youth pastor, your associate pastor, whatever it may be, the loved ones in your life that God has placed you there. The devil is doing all that he can to destroy those relationships and cause you to become an island, an isolated island all by yourself. And we know the end result of the devil's isolation is simply this, loneliness. His threefold purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. So for the next few moments, I want to give the devil a black eye tonight. For the next few moments, I want us to consider several people found in Scripture who were in a lonely place. But in time, they found that they were never really alone at all. The title for tonight's message is simply this, The Antidote for Life's Lonely Places. The Antidote for Life's Lonely Places. If you find yourself tonight in a lonely place, would you please allow me to encourage you with this thought? You may be lonely, but you are never alone. I said you may be lonely, but you are never really alone. Jesus is always there at the mention of his name to come rushing in and to rescue and to encourage you in your lonely hours. I don't care what's brought you to this lonely place in life, whether it's a loved one who's gone on too soon, whether it's the actions, the ungodly actions of another person, or maybe even it's the actions of yourself. Maybe you're reaping what you've sown in life. I want you to know that just the mention of Jesus' name can change everything, can turn everything around. He loves the lonely people of this world. He loves those that are hurting. He loves those that are fearful. He loves those that are scared. And my friend, tonight, I can say without question or shadow of a doubt, he loves you. Now, there are many, many, many people in the Bible who have found themselves in lonely places. Matter of fact, if we were to look at all of them tonight that are recorded in Scripture, if we were to begin to look and study all the illustrations and examples of people found in Scripture who've lived in lonely places, we would certainly run out of time. The morning sun would rise before we could finish looking at every illustration. But there are a few people in Scripture that need to be remembered. Their testimonies are given for examples for us to follow and to learn from. We can learn much from these fine folks. But before we do, I would like to call your attention to a very comforting portion of Scripture that will help combat any loneliness that we may feel from any lonely place that we walk in. I said I want to call our attention to a very comforting portion of Scripture that will help combat any loneliness that you and I feel from any lonely place that you and I may walk. I briefly alluded to the Scripture earlier. It's found in Proverbs 18 and 24. I read the first half, but purposely left off the second half because this will be our focus. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And then the second half of that scripture says this, and what a comfort it is. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I said there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. No matter how hard life gets, I want you to know without question or shadow of a doubt that God loves you and will stick closer to you than a brother. I said, God loves you and will stick closer to you than even your closest brother. So if you're discouraged tonight and you have had someone to share your life with all the way up until this point, and all of a sudden they're not there anymore, I want you to remember these words. You may be in a lonely place, 
but you're never alone. Why? Because Jesus has promised to walk close to your side. So let's look at some of the illustrations found in the Bible of those who have had to walk through some of life's lonely places. And maybe, just maybe, we may pick up a, a little something that will carry us through our lonely hours. No study on this scripture or this subject would be complete without looking at the life of one man who suffered greatly in this life simply because he loved God, and that man would be Job. Who could argue with the fact that Job was an upright and honest man? Who could argue with the fact that Job did all that he knew to do to please his God and to walk humbly before him? In fact, doesn't the Bible even testify of Job with these words? There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. What a wonderful testimony of an individual. What a wonderful testimony of a man who is willing to follow God and to do what he said. But it doesn't stop there because it goes on to say this. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Not only was Job perfect and upright, but apparently he was a very wealthy man, a very wealthy businessman. But what happened in the life of Job? Well, the Bible says this later on in that same chapter, that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord began to have a conversation with Satan and said unto him, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect, an upright man, one that fears God and shews evil? Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for not? Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And I love what the Bible says in the next verse. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord to do just that. And what an onslaught Satan made against this perfect and upright man. You see, Job didn't do anything wrong to bring about such great loss in his life. And one by one as the messengers came, and they said, they said to Job, Job, you've lost your children. There's been a great wind, and the house has collapsed, and they've died. And you've lost all of your substance. All of the, the business part of your life, all of your investments are gone. You've lost everything. And he seems to have lost it all. And then his wife even tells him to curse God and die. The only one of his family that's left even turns her back on him. And he seems to have lost it all. But in the darkest hour of his life, Job found that God was there for him. I said, in the darkest hour of his life, rather than giving in, he found that if he turned to God, he would see that God was there for him all the time. He was in a lonely place, but he wasn't alone. Perhaps there's someone listening tonight that's in a similar situation like Job. You're in a position where you've lost it all. You've lost your family. 
You've lost your health. You've lost your business. You've lost everything that you've worked for. The ones that you love the most have seen to turn their back on you. The counsel that you're getting is to turn your eyes away from God, to curse God, and to just die. But God says, turn to me. Look to me and live. In your darkest hour, lift up your eyes and behold my great love for you. If you're in that place tonight, I want to challenge you, please don't give up. Turn to God and find that the antidote for life's lonely places is found in a man who laid his life down on a cross and his name was Jesus. Then we have Daniel. Daniel was taken captive and brought into Egypt as a young man, a young teenager. And as a young boy, Egypt was certainly a lonely place. It was a foreign land, a foreign culture, a foreign language. He was living with the memory of the invasion that preceded this land. Yet through a series of events, Daniel obtained great favor, but it came with a great price. People hated him for his dedication to his God and did their very best to have him killed, even to the place where they would have a decree sign that says if anybody chooses to pray to anybody for who we say, that man will be killed. But instead of losing his life, Daniel was brought to a lonely place. He was brought to a lion's den in an attempt to end his life. He was brought to the place where he was separated from everything and then thrown into the lion's den in an attempt to end his life. Folks, let me tell you something tonight. A lion's den is a lonely place, a place where man has put you to end your life, a place that man has orchestrated circumstances to bring about your destruction is a lonely place, a place where you don't even know who you can trust anymore is a lonely place. But I want you to know that there's an antidote for that lonely place. There's a help in that lonely place, and that help comes from the Lord. That help comes from looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising the shame and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the pain of the cross so that he could give you peace and comfort in your lonely places. Oh, you may not be in a lion's den today, but you may feel like you're being consumed by the lions at work. You may feel the stabbing of the knife in the back when you go to work and those that are trying to get your position and degrade your name. You see, people hated Daniel for his dedication to his God. And if they hated Daniel because of his dedication to his God, they're going to hate you for your dedication as well. And they'll set out on a series of events to try to stop you just like they did him. Perhaps you're in a lonely place tonight because of the ungodly actions of others. If so, I've got good news for you. You may be in a lonely place. I said you may be in a lonely place, but you're not alone. Then there were his friends, the other three Hebrew boys that we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three Hebrew boys went through much of what Daniel had gone through. These boys were also taken captive and brought into a foreign land. And these were the men who simply refused to bow, simply refused to compromise. Yes, the order came and says, at the time that you hear the sound of the music, everybody's to bow down and worship the image that I have created, Nebuchadnezzar said. That's the decree. That's the law of the land. Everyone must do this. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that bowing down to that idol would be something that would displease their God. So they chose not to compromise. They chose not to bow. They were brought before the king. The king ordered them to bow and spare their life. And their response was simply this. King, we don't know if God will deliver us or not. But one thing that we do know is we're not going to bow and we're not going to compromise. 
Maybe tonight you've been listening and you've refused to compromise. You've refused to cheat on your taxes, cheat on your spouse, try to get ahead unjustly in this world. And you've been brought to a fiery furnace. And it looks like the end of everything good as you know it is about to come. I want you to know you may be thrown into the fire of adversity, but there was a fourth man in the fire who had the appearance of the Son of God. As you go into your fiery furnace for standing up for what's true and what's right and not being willing to bow or compromise, I want you to know that whenever you take that stand, Jesus will be there with you and he'll walk before you. You may be in a lonely place tonight, but I want you to be encouraged. You're not alone. And then lastly, there's Joseph. Joseph was a young man who God began to deal with at a young age. Dreams. God showed him great things were going to happen. Obviously, God had wonderful plans for Joseph's life, but his brothers hated him for it. Threw him into a pit and were going to destroy him, going to take his life from him. Can you imagine the very brothers, your very own flesh and blood, your siblings, want to rob and steal the life that God has given you. They want to take it from you. But here we have a young man who instead of his life being snuffed from him in that well, was pulled up and sold into slavery. Brought down again, much like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Brought down into a foreign land. But it was all in the providence and plan of God. I can imagine for those years that Joseph lived in Egypt. It must have been a very lonely place. Again, not understanding the language and not understanding the culture. Obtaining favor from the leadership that was there, all this, only to be falsely accused by a wicked woman of actions that were not of, were not of his. Thrown back into prison and forgotten about for year after year after year, until one day God said, that's enough. My servant, my son, my child will suffer no more. And overnight, Joseph was taken from the prison cell to the palace. He was riding in the second chariot, and God used him to save a nation in time of great famine. Joseph was in a lonely place, but he wasn't alone. Tonight you may be in a lonely place. Tonight you may be gripping the wheel of that steering wheel of that vehicle that you're driving in. Tears flooding down your eyes, saying, Brother Steve, you have no idea how lonely my life is. And my friend, you're right, I don't. But God does, and he cares about you. That's why he has this message. You may be sitting at home, you may be sitting at your computer, you may be listening by radio, and you say, Brother Steve, the tears of loneliness have flooded my face over and over and over again. I've walked in this lonely place for year after year after year for no fault of my own, for no reason of my own. I want you to know tonight, you're in a lonely place, but you don't have to walk alone. I want to bring this message to a close tonight. And we're about to pray. But I want you to know that if you're here and you're listening and you're in that lonely place, you're in that prison cell, you're in that lion's den, that fiery furnace, you're in a foreign land surrounded by strangers and strange customs and strange cultures, and you really don't know where to turn, would you allow me to encourage you to turn to the only one who can really give you eternal hope and help, and that's Jesus. Tonight I'm about to pray, and I challenge you, and I encourage you to pray with me and ask God to help you through your lonely places. Amen. Would you pray? Father, we thank you tonight, first of all, for Jesus, for what he did and how he loves us. We thank you that he was willing to go to the cross, shed his blood, and give his life 
so that we could receive forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Lord, there's some lonely people that are listening tonight that need a little encouragement along the way. I pray, God, that you would help them to see that a relationship with Jesus, allowing Jesus to come into their life and be their Lord and their Savior, would help them to navigate through these lonely places in life with a joy that they can't even explain. The Bible calls it a peace that passes all understanding. So tonight, we ask you for that, Lord. Jesus, forgive us of our sins. Come into our life. Change us and make us brand new. And Lord, tonight, for the lonely pastor, for the lonely preacher, for the lonely truck driver, for the lonely housewife, for the lonely spouse who's walking through a lonely place tonight, I ask you, Lord, to give them peace that passes all understanding. Tonight, we give them Jesus, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is truly our answer for life's lonely places. And we accept him with all of our heart. And we promise to live for him with your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Well, Steve, that was a good message. Um, if you ask Jesus into your heart tonight, uh, as the pastor says, it's, uh, it's just a simple thing. You just ask him into your heart and ask forgiveness of your sins. And if you did that tonight and you meant it, we'd like to hear from you. I'd like to offer you a Bible and some literature to help you in your walk with the Lord. Uh, maybe you need to talk to somebody or pray with somebody. We would be glad to do that, too. Just give us a call at uh, 60, at 816-729-6649. Or give us a text, or you can go to our website, extendhandsofgod.org. All our contact information is there, our email and everything. And, and you'd like to uh, find out more about the... Pastor Steve, we have a link on our website there to Bethel Pentecostal. Uh, take you to their website. Um, also, we'd like to make available to you our CDs. We have a lot of different testimonies, sermons. Um, those are all welcome to you free of charge. We can even get you on a list and send you a CD or two every month. Uh, if you want a copy of this one, uh, just get in contact with us. Uh, we'd also like to make available to you our mobile app. It's free. Just go to your app store and for extended hands of God, download it, all our sermons, and everything's updated uh, daily on there, so feel free to check it out. If you'd like to listen to this message again by your telephone or tell someone about it, just dial 605-562-0029. The access code is 812-193-714, and this is recording number 931-931. You're welcome to listen to it at any time share with your friends or family. So thank you for joining us here at Extended Hands. We've got Highway Ministries tonight, and God bless.